Working to contain the glass fire made all the more difficult for firefighters in Northern California who now have to shuttle in water because of unavailable hydrants. Already more than 7,500 homes and structures have burned this season. A reminder that what's happening in the environment may be the ultimate crisis. COVID cases on the rise in the U.S. Hospitalizations in Wisconsin surging 73% in the last week. President Trump in a rare move succumbing to calls to move one of his rallies in that state. While in the east, New York City closes its first school this season because of a potential outbreak. And Boston back in the red zone with hundreds of new cases. On defense, White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany pressed today on why the president refuses to unequivocally condemn white supremacy. McEnany then getting into a heated exchange over the president's claims about mail-in ballots. He says some were tossed in a river. The press secretary could not name which one. All of this as we're seeing long lines of early voters. Staggering job loss linked to the pandemic. Two major airlines beginning to lay off 32,000 employees. Democrats planning to vote for a bill that will never become law. Republicans digging in their heels, suffering Americans caught in the middle. Strength through adversity. The parents of special needs children who are doing everything they can to make sure they don't fall behind. We first met some of them during the height of the lockdown. It's been a tough few months, but they continue to persevere. Public pain. Pregnancy loss is one of the most painful and seldom talked about topics, yet model Chrissy Teigen and singer John Legend are sharing their heartbreaking story. And fact-checking the presidential debate when it comes to climate change. Our ginger Z's, it's not too late. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. All eyes on Wisconsin tonight, where the White House Coronavirus Task Force says it's seeing, quote, exponential growth in infections in Wisconsin. Despite that, the president is still planning to hold rallies there this weekend. He's moving one event to a town with lower cases. But across Wisconsin, cases are surging. Doctors are sounding the alarm, fearful they could be near the breaking point. While in Washington, lawmakers are still unable to come up with a much-needed bipartisan relief bill. Airlines, insurance companies, even our parent company, Disney, laying off a staggering number of people this week. We begin tonight with Stephanie Ramos in Wisconsin, one of 30 states seeing a rise in COVID cases. In Wisconsin, a painfully familiar scene. St. Mary's Hospital in Green Bay filling up with COVID patients. This department is near capacity. As you can see, uh, looking around, uh, we have patients in most of these rooms. And doctors sounding the alarm. We are coming to a breaking point in our ability to do things. You know, we are not overwhelmed, but you know, it's not, we're not that far away from that unless people truly take this really seriously. 20% of tests in Wisconsin coming back positive. 30 states are now seeing a rise in COVID cases. A long line today in Lakewood, New Jersey, where one in four people are testing positive for the virus. The city of Boston now in the high risk red zone after an uptick in cases, half of those in young adults. You want to be treated as adults? Well, then act at it. There's no reason to have parties. We're asking you to be responsible. Today, as the last wave of half a million students came back to New York City classrooms, one elementary school in Queens forced to shut down after two staffers tested positive. Here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, 32-year-old personal trainer Dan Unright never thought the virus would hit him so hard and land him in the same hospital where his wife, a nurse, was treating COVID patients. My chest pain started to get worse. When I came back to the room, I realized that I had to rip that mask off and catch my breath. You're seeing patients that are struggling with COVID every day. It was terrifying. I never expected it to be my family or my husband. I knew how bad it could get. Dan was put on oxygen and treated with convalescent plasma. After 10 days, oh. he was able to go home. The White House Coronavirus Task Force is seeing exponential growth in infections in Wisconsin, but President Trump will still hold rallies there this weekend, moving one rally out of La Crosse to Janesville after the mayor warned the Trump team he'd likely deny them a permit. Very little social distancing and, and very little mask wearing had me gravely concerned. Local officials now calling on the campaign to cancel the Janesville rally, saying it will put people in danger. Tonight, a reality check from vaccine maker Moderna, one of the companies the president hoped would have a vaccine by election day.
Just this week at the debate, President Trump saying he doesn't agree with his top scientists and is instead talking directly with the companies. I've spoken to Pfizer. I've spoken to all of the people that you have to speak to. We have great Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and others. They can go faster than that by a lot. Moderna now telling the Financial Times it won't apply for approval until at least late November and wouldn't have wide distribution before next spring. And for more now, let's bring in Stephanie Ramos, who's in Wisconsin tonight. And you mentioned Moderna, but the head of Pfizer is also concerned about the political rhetoric around vaccines. That's right, Lindsay. The head of Pfizer saying the political rhetoric is undercutting public confidence. He can't predict when or if a vaccine will be approved, but he says the world will be safer when we stop talking about the vaccine in political terms and instead focus on the science. And back to Wisconsin, because you spoke to the lacrosse mayor there who said that he would likely deny the Trump campaign a permit to hold a rally there. What else did he tell you about his concerns? So he says that even though these rallies are being held outside, he says it's still not safe. And that's what it, this is about. He wants to keep his community safe. He says based on the health data and based on health experts in La Crosse, people should be staying home, avoiding any social gatherings, any interactions with people outside of their own households, except for very essential things like work or having to go to the grocery store. But again, he says this is about keeping his community safe. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos on the ground for us in Wisconsin tonight. Thanks, Stephanie. Now turning to the latest in the race for the White House with 33 days to Election Day and voting already underway in many states. The White House is struggling to defend President Trump and his claims about the dangers of voting by mail. The president is also telling his supporters that they should show up to monitor polls on Election Day. But some state officials are pushing back, warning that it amounts to voter intimidation and harassment. Our chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl has the latest. Today in Fairfax, Virginia, lines of voters as far as the eye can see. Americans eager to vote and vote in person as the president spreads unfounded rumors and outright disinformation about voting by mail. This is crazy what's going on. This is crazy. Today, the White House was asked point blank to provide evidence about this claim made repeatedly by the president. They found a lot of ballots in a river. Uh, they throw them out if they have the name Trump on it, I guess. They're being dumped in rivers. This is a horrible thing for our country. It was a reporter from Fox News today who asked specifically what the president was talking about. Who is they that found those ballots, and where is this river anywhere in this country? The local authorities. It was a ditch in Wisconsin that they were found, and I can get the article oh, to your inbox if you like. And, and beyond that, that if, if he misspoke, that's fine. No, so that's, he meant, that's, he, he I meant believe, a ditch, he meant a, a, that's a, what the a president ditch rather than a to. river. And you're really, you're missing the forest for the trees here. The point is... I, know where, I, I, like, I cover the, the news, and is, I like to report accurately in the news. And when the president says they found a lot of ballots in a river, I simply want to know where the river is. No, you you simply want to ignore the fact of the matter. The White House never provided any evidence that ballots were thrown in a river. As for that ditch in Wisconsin, it turns out there was some mail found in a ditch, but state election officials said today there were no ballots from Wisconsin. No Wisconsin ballots were involved or impacted by that incident. Around the country, state officials are increasingly speaking out, particularly upset about this call to action by the president. I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. Democratic governors of 11 states issued a joint statement saying, quote, there is absolutely no excuse for promoting the intimidation or harassment of voters. Well, voters have a right to be left alone. They have a right to be left in peace and not be intimidated uh, or interfered with. President Trump has also suggested that people who vote by mail should show up at the polls on Election Day to make sure their vote was counted. The top elections official in Fairfax County, Virginia, today told me that could cause real problems. So what would happen if everybody that voted by mail did what the president said and came here and also in person? What, what would that do to you? Uh, that would almost, it would bring things to a stop, but some of these people would be in line until midnight tonight. Okay. So, so you don't once, want that to happen? No, we don't want that to happen. No, we want to get people through as quickly as, they, as we can. The voters here in Fairfax County are happy to wait in line, voting early and not taking any chances. It's worth the wait. No yeah, doubt it's so worth the no wait. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. How confident are you that this your vote's going to be counted? I feel way more confident than if I mailed it in. I want to make sure that my vote is counted. Mm -hmm.
So many looking for that reassurance and confirmation these days. Jonathan Carl joins us now. And John, the Republican governor of Texas, announced today a major change in how voters in Texas can drop off ballots early. Explain the change and the impact that it could have. The governor's proclamation says that each county in Texas can only have one drop-off location where people can return their mail-in ballots. That means uh, that a, a county like Harris County, where Houston is, has nearly 5 million people, 1,700 square miles miles uh, can only have one location where people can return uh, that mail-in ballot if they want to do it in person. Uh, the governor says this is for security reasons, that they can only afford to secure one location uh, per county. But as you can imagine, some local officials are saying that they would have no problem doing this, and this is really an effort to make it harder for people to vote. A long drive is in store for some of those yeah. looking to do that. Okay, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. And now to the severe economic strain in this country right now, the 28th week of historically high unemployment claims. 837,000 people applied for jobless benefits for the first time last week, with more than 26 million Americans collecting benefits for various programs. And today, the airline industry having one of its worst days in history as tens of thousands of workers were furloughed or laid off today. One American Airlines flight attendant giving that emotional farewell to passengers on her final flight. Really heartbreaking to hear that. For more on this story, let's bring in our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. And Gio, yesterday you reported that this was going to happen. What are you hearing now that the layoffs are in place? And do the airlines have any reason to remain hopeful? Well, Lindsay, right now we know that more than 40,000 airline employees are out of a job. And, and that heartbreaking sound that we heard there from that flight attendant, we are hearing that over and over and over again from all these different employees. One flight attendant told me that she doesn't even know if she's going to be able to work in this industry again. She just bought her home, and now she thinks she's going to lose that. So it's really heartbreaking. Uh, but the airlines are hoping that Congress passes new legislation. They want more federal funding. They are still not close on a deal yet. So we don't know if or when that's going to happen, Lindsay. And Gio, for some perspective here, it's not just airline workers who are going to really be feeling the effects of this, right? I mean, explain to us how the airlines getting hit can really affect the entire economy. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize this, but 10 million jobs are actually supported by the airline industry, and that means that we could really feel any ripple effects across this economy, and it could just take years to recover them. I hate to hear that. All right, Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. Teachers, parents, and students are certainly facing unique challenges amid the pandemic. Take a look at a video posted by a special education teacher in Queens, New York this morning. First day of in-person learning, New York City High School, and we, I have no children. We were supposed to have nine kids today. We got zero. And we had more kids show up live stream. So we're off to a very, very rough start. And my morale has dramatically decreased since I got here. That teacher did later post that more students ultimately showed up for in-person classes later on in the day. But with the virtual school year now underway for many families, tonight we wanted to take a closer look at just how the pandemic is affecting the learning of children with special needs. Many parents juggling their own jobs and the unique burden of children living with a disability, they're just stretched to the max. Some are wondering whether their children who have difficulty learning online might be left behind. Here's Devin Dwyer. 11-year-old Mariah Winchell, who has Down syndrome, is learning math by baking. Making what? Nothing. Cake pops. Cake pops. What kind of cake pops? Chocolate. Her living room and kitchen transformed into a classroom. We're still working on counting by twos, uh, so she'll jump from footstep foot to footstep here. Frosting. Frosting. Mom Melissa says <laughs> virtual learning at a computer isn't an option. Too overwhelming for her. This is a kid who gets 
special ed services every minute of her day when she's in school, right? So there's just this remote learning thing that's not working. It's a quiet struggle for families with special needs kids nationwide. Very hectic and uncertain. School is ready to start and I am working and I'm taking care of Nadia at the same time. It's really challenging. Making an already challenging existence even more challenging. More than 7 million American public school students receive special education services. But with COVID keeping many of those students home, some worry their kids are falling behind. A lot of parents rely on the additional supports they receive in school um, during the day to help in the development and growth of their children, um, and especially with children with special needs. There's a likelihood that they will fall behind um, much more than the average child. When the pandemic began, ABC News met four families with special needs children struggling to adjust to the new normal. One of the, the fights for us is, is, you know, keeping the front line for us here at home instead of possibly, you know, having to go to the hospital. I am on the couch for the second time since noontime today because I am just so tired. Six months later, the parents say the burdens of a school year at home are daunting. We're all kind of living in panic mode right now. Opal Foster lost her job as a graphic designer in March. She's still unemployed, but spends all day helping her son Jeremiah start eighth grade. It's become your full-time job, Opal. That is my full-time job. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite subject, Jeremiah? What do you like to learn? Art. Art. You like art. Okay. How is the financial picture right now for your family? Just looking at what's in my unemployment um, right now, that's going to run out at the end of October. So financially, I'm not really sure how the end of the year is going to look. How worried are you that Jeremiah will fall behind in his learning and his advancement and his growth? Things that I've seen as far as like regression, um, it definitely the social piece. Jeremiah used to be much more talkative. The social isolation weighing on parents too. I have been kind of isolated from other adults for a really long time. And you know, my mental health has, has paid a price for that. Rob Gorski, a single father of three in Ohio, says his autistic sons struggle with the change in routine. It's hard to replicate the structure and the routine and the support that you have in the classroom or in the school building at home uh, and, and, and find some kind of balance, which is the hardest, hardest part of this. There's no humans out here. A hike in the woods now doubles as gym class for the Gorskis. As for science, math, and English classes? It's been a little weird, to be honest. Um, there are some glitches that need to be worked out. Are you worried about them falling behind? Well, I think that's definitely going to be the case. You can play catch up you know, on the other side of this, because the priority is, is health and wellness at this point. Many kids with disabilities are in high-risk groups for COVID-19, making social distance and limits on visitors inside the home essential. You no, know, we feel very fortunate we have jobs, but to be trying to do that and then do this as well, trying to educate her is... Uh, it's a huge undertaking. We're really tired. <laughs> the Winchells, who are both teachers, have spent hundreds of dollars turning their home into an interactive school, taking turns working with Mariah, then tending to their other students, giving lectures and grading papers late into the night. Have you thought about taking a break from your day job to, to teach your kid? I have. Um, I think... I think it's an open question right now. I don't have all the data yet to make a decision. Probably the biggest challenge now is uh, is just educating three kids, um, basically running an elementary school in our home. Annie, do you want to read a story? Megan Scully and Chris DeBott say each bit of progress is worth celebrating. Water. You want water? Their son, Danny, who's starting kindergarten, had just begun speaking using his eyes when the pandemic hit. I, I think it's progressed um, in a different way than if he were using it sort of organically in a classroom. Um, but his amazing speech therapist, um, Corinne, has uh, continued. We had five sessions a week with her through the pandemic.
All of the families heaping praise on those unsung heroes helping them get by. Her name is Jen Bellady. She's um, Mariah's instructional aide and is responsible for her one-on-one, -on -one, usually in a typical school day. She still comes and visits here. What has really helped us are the essential workers, the people who deliver our groceries, the UPS guy, you know, our, our Amazon deliveries. Karen Oling, she's been absolutely phenomenal. Okay, so put it away. Where do you get your optimism from? Jay's been really great through all of this, and um, he's a pocket full of sunshine, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> what a sweetheart. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks, bud. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, mommy's fine. <laughs> mommy's fine. So many parents keeping faith in their special needs children and the power of their love. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that piece. And when we come back, the dramatic moments when police bust down a door and rescue a kidnapped woman. See how it all played out. The heartbreaking loss of a power couple and why singer John Legend and Chrissy Teigen are speaking out about their pregnancy loss. But up next, our closer look at far right groups, particularly the Proud Boys. Stay with us. stories of our time anytime nightline welcome to disney plus are you ready drop in and explore the action the adventure and the originals there's no limit to what you'll find these are your worlds so come on Dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney+. Plus. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, it's me too. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every right. night taking on we this moment right. for America. Turning Point, the we Nightline event. Right. Late night on ABC. Police have charged a Michigan man with ethnic intimidation after they say Michael Frederick fired shots into a black family's home, sprayed racist graffiti on their cars and slashed their tires. The family says that they were targeted for three days. Frederick has asked the family for forgiveness and claims this was not about race. And we are taking a closer look at the Proud Boys after President Trump's refusal to denounce white supremacists at Tuesday's debate. There are reports of soaring membership in the 24 hours following the debate. And Facebook is also reporting an uptick in content related to the group. This is the FBI now has more than a thousand domestic terrorism investigations currently underway, the largest number involving white supremacists. There is growing concern over white supremacy in this country after that stunning moment at the first presidential debate. Who would you like me to condemn? White supremacists and right proud Proud boys, boys, stand back and stand by. The president failing to denounce white supremacists and right-wing militias in front of 73 million viewers, instead telling a far-right group to, quote, stand by. That moment certainly caught the attention of the Proud Boys founder, who was podcasting the debate live. Now that far-right group is under the microscope. Trump 2020! 
The Proud Boys, who describe themselves as a Western chauvinist group, is a growing presence at rallies, some armed with guns, staging a counter demonstration to a Black Lives Matter protest in Portland on Saturday. The group has also appeared alongside other extremist groups at gatherings like the deadly 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Their leaders say they are not white supremacists, but according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the group is known for misogynistic and anti-Muslim rhetoric and has made allies of white supremacists and attracts some openly racist and violent people. They see the left and anti-fascists as their predominant enemies. And the Proud Boys really see themselves as acting on behalf of Trump and acting hand in hand with law enforcement. The Southern Poverty Law Center says that in 2019, they counted 44 different Proud Boys chapters across the country and that they were kicked off of Facebook in late 2018 because of their history of violence. Frank Mink, a former white supremacist, now anti-racism activist, says the kind of recognition Proud Boys got from the president only emboldens them. It emboldens them and it emboldens their leadership. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. And with the election approaching, there are fears that the Proud Boys and other far-right groups will mobilize. We um, have already seen them signal that they plan to monitor the polls um, or to be active on election day. You know, Trump has long talked about law and order, the need for law and order. And increasingly, groups like the Proud Boys and militias um, are seeing it as their duty to go out and impose law and order. Elizabeth Newman, a former assistant DHS secretary in charge of counterterrorism who resigned in April, says that the president's words are creating conditions for domestic extremism to flourish. For three and a half years, you had people inside the government begging the White House to take this issue up, and they were silenced. I've come to the conclusion that's because it's because he didn't want to do anything about white nationalism, because he views those uh, folks as his supporters. You can check out our new documentary, Homegrown Hate, The War Among Us, right here on ABC News Live next Tuesday at 8 Eastern and Pacific. Still ahead here on Prime, one of Putin's fiercest critics is now saying the Russian leader is directly responsible for his poisoning, and he describes what it felt like. The task force now being set up to study possible reparations for black Americans in the nation's largest state. We'll speak with a lawmaker behind the initiative. Plus, can you guess the person one study found is responsible for more online misinformation than anyone else? The answer might surprise you. But first, our tweet of the day, Gabby Giffords reminding us all of a staggering loss that happened just three years ago. coronavirus has affected so many of you. America has changed for now. There's no question about that. People are finding a way to come together. What else should people know about how to care for their families through this? And you feel it's not too late to flatten the curve? It's not too late. When do we expect to have a vaccine? George, we are all thinking of you, Allie, and the kids, my friend. She wanted to share this message. You know I'm feverish if I'm allowing myself to go on national television with no makeup on. Allie is now on the Roberts family prayer chain. Robin, how you doing? I'm loving this. Oh, I'm gonna keep these slippers on. We are so grateful that we get to do this from home. I'm gonna take the camera and turn it around. <laughs> Kelly was doing prompter. You do know you're sideways, right? <laughs> Great to see so many Americans stepping up. All in this together. The world coming together as one. We're gonna get through this together. Right here with you on Good Morning America. Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every night, taking on this moment for America. Turning Point, the Nightline Event, late night on ABC. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7. ABC News. There for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start here, free, on Apple Podcasts.
Welcome back, everyone. Widespread misinformation about COVID-19 is a serious threat to public health, and it's been called an infodemic by the World Health Organization. Now, an alarming new study finds that the single largest driver of this misinformation is President Donald Trump. We take a look by the numbers. 1.1 million articles with COVID-19 misinformation were published between January 1st and May 26th, according to researchers at Cornell University. That's almost 3% of all 38 million English language media articles about the pandemic that were analyzed for this study. Mentions of Trump made up 37.9% of what researchers referred to as the overall misinformation conversation about COVID-19, leading them to conclude that the president is the number one driver of this so-called infodemic. Breaking down the misinformation by topics, researchers found that 26% had to do with misleading claims about COVID cures and treatments like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. And about 40,000 articles or 3.6% of all misinformation suggests that the coronavirus is at least in part a hoax by the Democratic Party to help win elections. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. For the first time in 12 years, climate change was brought up in a presidential debate. In this week's It's Not Too Late, Ginger Z gives us a much needed fact check on what we heard from both candidates. This is scientists are giving us a staggering warning about the plant life on Earth. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Premieres Tuesday, streaming on ABC News Live. Hello? This is Montana Highway Patrol. Did you're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last seen in a red focus. Has gone. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. No, I won't be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Got ourselves a predicament. When the night has gone. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. It's being called the most consequential election of a lifetime. The most important vote. And with so much on the line, it demands the most straightforward, newsmaking, real answers. The most informed voices from all sides. The countdown is on to the vote. What will our future look like? ABC's This Week with George. It all plays out right here every Sunday. The most consequential week yet of this hyper-political year. Right as you get closer to casting your vote every Sunday on ABC. First presidential debate. You're the, the worst way, president voice. America has hey, ever had. Hey, hey, Come Joe, on. Me, there's nothing smart about you, Joe. Now extending to the campaign trail. An entitled, self serving president who inherited everything in his life and squandered it. Joe Biden is too weak to lead this country. Some voters criticizing the president for refusing to condemn white supremacists during the debate. It would have been very, very simple and easy for him to just say, yes, I do not back white supremacy. That is terrible. We need to get rid of that. Does the president denounce white supremacism and groups that espouse it in all their forms? This has been answered yesterday by the president himself, the day before by the president himself on the debate stage. The president was asked this. He said, sure, three times. Both presidential candidates will appear on video at tonight's Al Smith dinner here in New York City. Annual fundraiser held by the New York Archdiocese will go viral for the first time in its 75-year existence. 
There's not much relief in sight from the federal government. Here we are on our knees. Congress failing to reach an agreement in a new coronavirus relief stimulus package. The previous bill expired in July, with another 837,000 Americans filing unemployment claims last week alone. A new report from the New York State Comptroller's Office says in the next six months, up to half of all bars and restaurants in New York City could close, potentially costing a 150,000 jobs, many of which belong to immigrants. Meantime, Thursday morning, more than 40,000 airline workers woke up without a job, furloughed or laid off after federal funding ran out at midnight. The months-long no-sale order for cruise ships was set to expire Wednesday, but is now extended until October 31st. Dramatic body cam video shows the moments police officers in Tampa, Florida entered the home of a man accused of holding his ex-girlfriend hostage. Police say 24-year-old Tyree Sneed snuck into the victim's home, held her and another person at gunpoint, and then used her vehicle to drive them to his apartment. In the four hours holding her, Sneed spotted officers while they were trying to evacuate neighbors. The suspect was apprehended without further incident and later charged with multiple crimes. The victim was said to be scared, but otherwise unharmed. The alarming new report tonight making global headlines on climate change. Scientists now warning 40% of the world's plant life is in danger of becoming extinct. Researchers say 140,000 species could be lost forever because of human activity. That study is submitted by more than 200 scientists in 42 countries. And former President Jimmy Carter turned 96 today, the oldest living former president in U.S. history, spending the day with his wife, Rosalind, at their home in Plains, Georgia. And late today, the image is coming in, the community turning out with a drive-by birthday parade, the Carters right there, waving from their chair. Carter was the nation's 39th president in office from 1977 to 1981. He has largely receded from public view amid the coronavirus pandemic and his own health challenges. Yet Carter remains a quiet force in politics at home and in public health and human rights advocacy around the world. We turn now to Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who is speaking out for the first time since recovering from a suspected poisoning by a known Russian nerve agent. Navalny told the German newspaper Der Spiegel that Russian President Vladimir Putin is responsible for the attack that left him in an induced coma fighting for his life. For more on this story, we bring in ABC's Ian Panel. Ian, why is Navalny so sure that Putin is behind the attack? And if that's the case, why would they allow him to leave Russia and seek treatment in Germany? I mean, Lindsay, I think it's partly a process of deduction and also a process of examining recent history. Um, he thinks that the only people who could get their hands on this particular nerve agent, which was developed in Soviet times, would have to be a state agency. And the British intelligence, when the Skripals were poisoned here in the UK, also by Novichok, came to a very similar conclusion that it had to be either the FSB, uh, the replacement for the KGB, or Russian military intelligence. And he is is adamant that the only people who could have authorized that uh, uh, sit at the top of the Kremlin, in other words, Vladimir Putin himself. Does he have empirical proof? No. The Kremlin responded strongly, uh, dismissing the allegations, saying that they were insulting uh, and saying that they were also baseless. And, and how does Navalny describe his illness and has he fully recovered yet? I mean, really powerful. He says it was like having a nuclear bomb dropped on him. And he also makes the point that if someone wanted to poison him without also sending a strong signal, then there are any number of different kinds of methods of doing it. Using Novichuk does send a signal. That's his interpretation and many other people's that it had to be a state agency. It also sends a message to other people. Now, he is in the process of recovering. Doctors there have said that he hopes to recover at least 90% of his prior fitness, if not 100%, uh, but he's having daily exercise, daily physio, daily walks, and it is a long, tough process. But incredible to see him, uh, you know, able to sit up, able to go walking after what happened to him. And, and Navalny says that he wants to return to Russia. Why would he want to do that? I mean, how could it be safe for him? 
Yeah, I mean, look, a great question, right? And it's one that the interviewers put to him. Um, it was really moving, actually, because he describes his hands shaking, which was something the interviewers noticed as well. He said, my hands don't shake because I am scared. My hands shake because of what they did to me. Uh, I am not afraid. I have to go back because if I don't, in essence, what he says is that Putin will have won. Again, his allegation that Putin was responsible, whether he was or whether he wasn't, certainly having Navalny out of the scene would remove the most potent opposition leader in Russia, a thorn in the side of the Kremlin, a thorn in the side of Vladimir Putin. And so he feels he has to go back for himself and for his supporters. Ian Panel, our thanks to you for your reporting. The loss of pregnancy is always painful and often private, yet model and TV host Chrissy Teigen and singer John Legend are sharing what many suffer alone. Kaylee Hartung has more on why. Tonight, a heartbreaking battle being shared with the public. Supermodel and television host Chrissy Teigen revealing devastating news that she and her husband, singer John Legend, just lost a child, saying, we are shocked and in the kind of deep pain you only hear about, the kind of pain we've never felt before. The parents of two posting pictures of their painful journey. Here, holding their baby boy, they named Jack. Tegan suffering serious complications that sent her to the hospital just three days ago. We all know I've been on bed rest for a few weeks. I was always, always bleeding. Um, you know, I'm about like halfway through pregnancy. It can be a potentially life-threatening emergency if you're not in a hospital setting, but again, the awareness is key. Early today, Tegan tweeting, driving home from the hospital with no baby. How can this be real? Legend adding, we love you, Jack. Because pregnancy losses are common, doctors say talking about it is important. Women feel that they have had some guilt associated with that. So it's always important to make sure that the emotional aspect and impact of a fetal loss and a stillborn is specifically met with the support system that that person has around them. And Lindsay, Chrissy Teigen's willingness to share her tragic story, it's a moment for women to remember. If you experience similar loss, you're not alone and you don't have to suffer in private. Lindsay. Our thanks to Kaylee for that reporting. This week, California made history. On Wednesday, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a first-of-its-kind law forming a task force to study the state's role in slavery and make recommendations for reparations. California joined the union as a free state in 1850, but still had a history of slavery until the 13th Amendment in 1865. The bill's author, California Assemblywoman Shirley Weber, joins us now. Thank you so much for your time, Assemblywoman. Thank you for the invitation. So you hope that this bill will inspire national action. How long have you been fighting for this? And, and walk us through what you hope will happen next. Well, I think what is uh, what we've been fighting for is, as you probably looked at the records, it's been 30 or 40 years in which every year someone from the Congressional Black Caucus introduced a reparations bill, and it's never gotten very far. And so we wanted to basically call for a commission that would begin the study of reparations in California. The, the bill calls for the establishment of a, a commission of nine individuals. Uh, the governor will appoint five, and the president pro tem and the, and the speaker will appoint two and each. And so we will have nine persons who will be from their various backgrounds and academic backgrounds as well, who will be looking into the impact of California's uh, sla slavery in California uh, and, uh, and its impact today, not only what took place then, but also more importantly, what impact it continues to have on California on the economic and educational life of African Americans in the state of California. So many might remember that in July, Asheville, North Carolina approved a reparations resolution. Now, instead of direct cash, the city plans to make investments in areas where black residents face disparities. Is that something that you would consider an option for California, or is the bottom line that you're hoping that this law will spur the state of California to directly pay descendants of slaves? Well, you know, I, th I don't know if there could be a, a direct payment to the descendants of slaves with regards to the number of years that have been passed, but that is surely something that people can consider. We have not taken any option off the table uh, because we don't want a, a fast response to it to say, okay, we'll give everybody $30,000 and then we're done uh, without actually realizing that the problem may be much deeper than that. Uh, we want to basically do a complete and, and clear assessment of the damage done and come up with solutions that would have an impact 
on people's lives and that would change their lives uh, and, th and their children's lives so that we can actually try to level the playing field. So it, I doubt if it'll be a quick fix, like a couple thousand dollars, uh, but we hope that it will be a comprehensive study that will make some really good and deep recommendations about how we change California. And, and what's your response to critics of, of this bill who say that the national government, not states, should be responsible for reparations? Uh, they're absolutely correct. The federal government should be responsible and should be, but it's not. And oftentimes, California leads the way. I mean, we've often wavered for a number of things, whether it's dealing with issues of law enforcement and federal policies, uh, and, and they have not come. Uh, we realize in California we can probably do things a little faster, and we believe that given the size of California, we're not just some little itty-bitty state. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. And so we've waited long enough for the federal government that is so, in many ways, very difficult, as we know, um, to bring the kind of change that's necessary. And so California plans to lead the way in this and and not be in the back seat but hopefully in the driver's seat uh, to help uh, others to see that what is possible as a result of, of California's efforts. Uh, of course, as you would know, there was an original promise of 40 acres and a mule. Why do you think that national movements to make amends for slavery have repeatedly failed over the years? And does this year's so-called racial reckoning our country is going through give you hope that now is the right time for this conversation and beyond the talking for the doing? Well, we hope so. Uh, we hope that those who are uh, serious about it stay focused on it and that um, and that they recognize the what has been done. You know, the, the 40 acres and a mule, someone says it, it, if you basically added it up and, and multiplied and figured out over the years, it would be a huge settlement for, uh, for African Americans or anyone. Uh, and we didn't get it. But it was interesting that they recognized the fact that simply freeing from slavery did not necessarily give them an equal footing or, an or even an opportunity to get on an equal footing because they didn't own land and they didn't even if they had land they didn't have a way of working that land you know there are those who still believe that that they don't owe us anything that we have had equal opportunity that we can basically uh, move forward and make a difference and it's interesting because no other group has that has been misused by the United States has ever been treated in that manner. And so that, too, is a part of the legacy of, of asking ourselves the question, why is it that we've never felt that we needed to do something in terms of reparations for African Americans who suffered the worst kind of discrimination in this country. And we've never felt a sense of obligation at the federal level that we needed to atone for the sins of our, of our fathers and even of ourselves. And um, and so that in itself addresses the, the issue and, and, and it feeds into what is happening in the streets right now. People ask the question, how could somebody do this to George Floyd like that for almost nine minutes? You have to look at the history of this country and its relationship to African Americans and how it has never really taken full responsibility for slavery, never believed that it was a, a, a horrible thing that we did, and even after it's over, never realized that their fathers and their forefathers benefited from slavery and to this day still own the land and the resources that they amassed from slavery. Uh, so it, it is a, hopefully this will be an educational piece as well for the public to understand of the just how deep and powerful the institution of slavery was in this country and how it still affects people today in terms of their privilege or lack of privilege in the society. Assemblywoman Shirley Weber, we thank you for the history lesson, for the education and for your time tonight. Well, thank you. We look forward to the results and sharing that result, the results with the world, so people can really understand the impact of slavery on the lives of African Americans. And I'm excited about that. We'll stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. And when we come back, breaking down what we know about the connection between the devastating wildfires out west and climate change. being called the most consequential election of a lifetime, the most important vote, and with so much on the line, it demands the most straightforward, newsmaking, real answers, the most informed voices from all sides. The countdown is on to the vote. What will our future look like? ABC's This Week with George. It all plays out right here every Sunday. The most consequential week yet of this hyper-political year. Right as you get closer to casting your vote every Sunday on ABC.
seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. On your cards. Get set. Let's go. Get ready. The team with the highest card total could be leaving with a hundred thousand dollars. To shop. Bam. 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 Till you drop. Down. <laughs> Leslie Jones host Supermarket Sweep premieres Sunday, October 18th on ABC. I'm very thankful that these men are fine. Tuesday, October 13th, we respect your wishes. <laughs> the Bachelorette is back. This is the perfect place to fall in love. But respect the rumors. Do not ever talk to me like that. It's true. What? This is the most shocking season ever. Makes me sick. We. That's crazy. Do. <laughs> Declare. Congratulations, you've just blown up The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette, season premiere Tuesday, October 13th on ABC. The Atlanta Falcons are planning a new tactic to make sure their stadium is safely cleaned once fans are welcomed back again. Beginning after the team's first home game with fans October 11th, the Falcons will deploy two special cleaning drones. You see them there to disinfect the seats in the stadium. Not. debate in history. In fact, the question on climate broke a long silent streak from moderators on the topic. Here to break it all down for us is Ginger Z with another segment of It's Not Too Late. Hi, I'm Ginger Z and it's not too late. If you watch the debate, they actually did talk about climate change. And this week was the first time in 12 years that a moderator has asked about climate change in a presidential debate. I'd like to talk about climate change. So would I. What do you believe about the science of climate change, sir? Uh, I believe that we have to do everything we can to have immaculate air, immaculate water, and do whatever else we can that's good. You know, we're planting a billion trees, the Billion Tree Project, and it's very exciting for a lot that, of people. You believe that human Pollution, gas, greenhouse gas emissions contributes to the global warming of the planet? I think planet. a lot of things do, but I think to an extent, yes. And like the rest of the evening, there were a lot of statements made that would benefit from some additional context or an outright fact check. So we thought it might be helpful to break it down. Let's start with Vice President Joe Biden's comment on storms like the derecho that hit Iowa in August. He said that they wouldn't have happened before temperatures started warming. We're in real trouble. Look what's happened just in the Midwest with these storms that come through and wipe out entire sections and counties in Iowa. They didn't happen before. They're because of global warming. While the derecho in Iowa was significant and there are still piles of debris lining the streets of Cedar Rapids nearly two months later, the agricultural impacts bigger than they've ever seen, Derechos are not as uncommon as you might think. Climatologically, that part of Iowa actually gets a derecho every year. Now, it's not always as strong or covering the same populated area, but derechos in themselves are not rare. I fell in love with weather partly because of a similar derecho with 130 mile per hour winds, a disaster in West Michigan in 1998. We're all gonna die, tell you the truth. We knew this was coming. I just don't think we knew the extent. And then there was the one I covered in Virginia. Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell has declared a state of emergency, littered with debris and still impassable throughout the day. The candidates spent the most time, though, on wildfires, and rightfully so. Nearly four million acres have burned in California alone this year. That's two times the previous all-time record in 2018. So you get these giant numbers, an epic season, and everybody just wants to find one culprit, when really, there are several. 
Climate change is exacerbating the wildfires by extending the heat, which dries out the foliage, and not just in California, but around the globe. Everything gone, clothes, beds, everything. When asked if President Trump believes in the impact of climate change, he keeps emphasizing the need for forest management. As far as the fires are concerned, you need forest management in addition to everything else. The forest floors are loaded up with trees, dead trees that are years old and they're like tinder, and leaves and everything else. You drop a cigarette in there, the whole forest burns down. Forest management is a huge piece of this disastrous fire season puzzle in the American West not just California. I think forest management means something fairly different than what a lot of folks might assume. What forest management means in this context uh, to maintain healthier forests that are less vulnerable to catastrophic fires actually means introducing more frequent low intensity fire. And then just to clarify, prescribed burn or a good fire is the most realistic mitigation versus raking leaves or picking up dead trees. Yes. To be clear, the forest management that most of the ecologists and climate scientists have considered as a potential intervention, it does not mean cutting down forests. It does not mean raking the forest floor. With an extended fire season, the window for safe prescribed burns is smaller than in other states. And then the next natural question is, who's responsible for managing those forests? You can't every year have Hundreds of thousands of acres of land just burned to the ground. But sir, That's but, burning down because of a lack of management. Sir, Turns out the state of California is only responsible for 3% of their forest management. 52% are federally managed and 45% are private. Many of the recent fires actually started on federal land, which on this map you can see represents a lot of the state. And the cause of those was lightning. Both California and federal land agencies have made changes to the way that they manage forests, but of course more could be done. More frequent, lower intensity fire in a lot of these landscapes may be one of the best intervention tools that we have. And the other intervention tool is probably thinking more carefully about how we design our communities and how we build our buildings. So far, we haven't done either of these things on a very large scale. Can I also just point out that humans absolutely cause a majority of wildfire ignitions. Whenever I post about this, you all say, yeah, but what about arson? Well, unintentionally, humans do set a lot of fires. 2.3 million acres of the 3.9 million acres burned this year in California, though, started naturally. Lightning, not arson, not negligence. And then during the debate, they got to cars. And it's a worthy topic because transportation represents 28% of our greenhouse gases in this country. Now, Trump was asked about his administration's decision to roll back rules that would have required all new cars to get 50 miles per gallon by 2025. That was a standard set by the Obama administration, partly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. The Trump administration froze those standards at 40 miles per gallon, saying that the Obama era rule would have made cars too expensive. The EPA and Department of Transportation say that that will make roads safer as people can afford to replace older cars. Why have you relaxed fuel economy standards that are gonna create more pollution from cars well, and trucks? Well, not really, because what's happening is the car is much less expensive and it's a much safer car, and you're talking about a tiny difference, and then what would happen, because of the cost of the car, you would have at least double and triple the number of cars purchased. But Trump's comment that cars would be much cheaper does not include how much more drivers would pay for gas over time and the overall consequences of allowing more greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. Increasing fuel economy will dramatically lower global warming pollution. That's just basic science. So the rollback will significantly increase global warming pollution. It would be much cheaper by $3,500. They've simply no, ignored No, but you would take your, a lot of cars off the market because people would be able to afford a car. Look, we just follow the numbers at Consumer Reports and the numbers are pretty clear. Americans spend a lot of money every year on gas and fuel economy will help them save that money. So what's happening here is by rolling back fuel economy standards, this administration is gonna cost consumers over $3,000 more on fuel over the life of their cars 
and that's going to more than wipe out any benefits from a slightly lower cost for the vehicle. Even though some of the statements in this week's debate didn't give the full story about climate change, it is long overdue to see questions about the future of our planet on a national stage. If you want to learn more about the latest science on climate change before you watch the next debate, the government has a lot of very helpful information online. You can go to NOAA, NASA, or the National Climate Assessment. I'm Ginger Z, and I promise it's not too late. We are holding Ginger to that promise. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. A grandson posted this photo of a bucket full of baseballs and a heartfelt note he found from his grandfather urging someone to take them. The note reads, I pitched them to my son and grandson for countless rounds. He adds they both grew up and moved away and what he would give to still be able to pitch a couple of buckets to them. Tonight, we salute all the amazing grandparents out there who have given memories we will forever cherish. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night. Thanks for streaming with us on Your Voice, Your Vote, The Breakdown. I'm Terry Moran in Washington. And I'm Diane Macedo in New York. Today we're diving into the issues of race and policing in the United States. The police killings of black people all over the past several months have ignited new energy in a movement that has been growing for years. Protesters have taken to the streets by the thousands in cities across the country, expressing outrage at what they see as systemic or institutionalized racism within law enforcement organizations. Today we'll hear from multiple perspectives on that issue and hopefully have some productive conversations. Hopefully it's a complicated issue. We're going to break it down. But first, we are just 33 days away from Election Day and President Trump's campaign is moving forward in the aftermath of the chaotic first debate. The Commission on Presidential Debates is now considering changing the rules of the next debates. But will the campaigns go along with it? The president's debate performance has sparked a torrent of criticism that even his most ardent allies have struggled to contain. And Republicans on Capitol Hill are now distancing themselves from the president after he failed to disavow a far-right fascist group, the Proud Boys, saying this instead. Proud Boys, Proud Boys stand back and stand by. The Senate's only black Republican, Tim Scott of South Carolina, calling on Trump to explain himself. Uh, I think he misspoke. I think he should correct it. If he doesn't correct it, I guess. He didn't misspeak. Trump tried to walk back his comments, claiming ignorance, even though the Proud Boys were clearly described to him as white supremacists during the debate. I don't know who the Proud Boys are. But he still failed to denounce the group. Oh, in the wake really? of the bedlam and rancor that dominated the stage in Cleveland. There's nothing smart about you, Joe. Will you who shut is your, up, man? Listen, who Many are questioning who if the first presidential debate of the year will also be the last. So after that debate, the Commission on Presidential Debates, that's a bipartisan group which has been doing this for 30 years. They're talking about giving the moderator a switch that could turn off the microphone of any candidate who repeatedly interrupts or otherwise violates the rules. The Washington Post is out with an analysis. They say candidates were interrupted 90 times in 90 minutes, and Donald Trump interrupted 71 of those times. Diane? And Terry, back to one of the issues that played a big role in that debate, race and policing. Protesters turned out in droves, many for the first time to call for change in a system they say discriminates against black Americans. But will that activism make a difference at the ballot box? ABC's Rachel Scott has more. They've taken to the streets, chanting the names of black lives lost. A summer of racial unrest now turning into a call to action to vote on Election Day. met 23-year-old Ariana Evans back in May. It was her first time demonstrating. No justice, no peace. It's been almost 130 days since the death of George Floyd, and Ariana has been marching ever since. We want institutional change. We want police to have better. 